I have the pleasure of introducing you to our cross-sector panel led by Laura Cohn, Executive Director of Education Synergy Alliance. So I will leave it up to Laura. All right, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are so excited to be here. So, uh, and gotta credit Eda Beta for the title of our panel, Steam from Soup to Nuts and Bolts, <laughs> with soup represented on the far end over there. <laughs> um, what, what we're trying to do with this panel, we, we seem miscellaneous, and I guess we are miscellaneous in a lot of ways, but what we are representing with this collection of folks is the fact that when STEAM itself is about integration, and it also at its best, um, um, and almost every time requires partnership. So uh, we represent a group of partners with our school district folks and uh, university folks and industry and an arts organization. So we're gonna bring you um, these various perspectives on uh, STEAM, what they represent for us in, um, in each of their individual um, perspectives on the work and the work that they're doing to bring STEAM alive in our community um, and also try and weave it together a bit. Um, and one thing that uh, has helped me think about this idea this morning was Yvonne this morning when she talked about we are all bringing a piece of cloth to the table and we're stitching it together, and yet if all, if the only cloths that were brought to the table were the ones that were brought by the educators, our cloth would have lots of holes in it. It really needs um, the partners in the community um, and those um, around us to help make that cloth whole, to make it beautiful, and to make it something that we're excited to have a wonderful steamy meal on. <laughs> Um, so here's our panel, um, starting with myself. I'm Laura Cohn, I'm the Executive Director of the Education Synergy Alliance, which is an 18-month-old nonprofit here in San Diego County whose purpose is to bring partners together to help enable transformative education um, opportunities in the community. And our two um, initiatives at this point are, one's called Linked Learning, which is bringing to life a, a career pathways in high schools using the linked learning approach, um, starting in five school districts, but hopefully spreading beyond. And then our other big initiative is uh, P3, so linking up early education and early elementary grades to create a seamless continuum of quality learning experiences for children. And hopefully you can see that STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, is, there are great opportunities for STEAM in both of those initiatives. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today. To my right is Ed Hidalgo, uh, our host. Your formal title is uh, Senior Director at Qualcomm in charge of the contingent, no, Global Contingent Workforce, but he, uh, as with many of these panelists, has really stepped beyond that formal role to create the Think A Bit Lab here at Qualcomm, which is creating incredible opportunities for um, young people across our community and also to provide leadership in the region for education change. Really appreciate you. Um, beside him is Ed Abeda. You've met Ed already. He's our, the founder of STEAM Connect, um, a national leader in the idea of STEAM, and also um, you know, his formal role. There's these formal roles informal. Ed formally um, is an assistant dean at UCSD Extension. Um, DeLuke Smith is president and CEO of San Diego Youth Symphony. And how many of you were at the event last night and got to see Duluth and his organization honored. So some of you, not so many. So many of you aren't familiar with the great work that um, Duluth and his organization are doing in schools in our community. Um, and I, I urge you, I'm sure there's a link to the video about um, uh, San Diego Union Symphony on the Steam Connect um, website. I really encourage you to watch it. It's inspirational um, for sure. But in his role at San Diego Union Symphony, he's also a community leader for Steam um, and is on the board of Steam Connect. Roman Del Rosario is um, the Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction at Sweetwater High School District, just um, uh, started that job this year after being the principal of a high school, of Sweetwater High School, right? 
Um, and he's working in that role across Sweetwater School District to um, bring STEM and STEAM to life in their schools um, and, and work with his schools in a continuous um, infusion of those ideas. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, Roman. And Suzette Lovely, superintendent in Carlsbad, um, Carlsbad uh, School District. And I know there are some Carlsbad folks here. I saw, I saw oh, look at that. <laughs> Suzette, you're well represented. Um, so, and Suzette also, in addition to the um, wonderful work she does leading that district, has provided regional leadership around career pathways and integration of uh, work-based learning opportunities for um, high school students um, in our community. So she's um, also stepping out and beyond. So thank you to all of our panelists. And we thought we would start the conversation by getting grounded um, with our school folks, um, with our school district leaders. So Suzette and Roman, could each of you tell us briefly about the ways STEAM is showing up in the schools in your district? Give us some examples and also give us a sense for, um, for how STEAM is part of your district priorities. Yeah, uh, thank you. and, and uh... And I just want to appreciate, I want to say I'm, I'm grateful to have this opportunity to share uh, some of the stories and some of the work that we're doing at Sweetwater Union High School District. So uh, as, as someone um, who's a former science teacher, um, I, I grew up in South San Diego, the same region where Sweetwater Union High School District is. And, it, and when I went to UC Irvine, uh, it was real obvious to me that um, I was ill-prepared for those, for those challenges and the rigor and the type of thinking, critical thinking as a biology major at UC Irvine. Mm -hmm. and, and that was something that I took with me as, as, a, as a personal mission to bring access to students um, to those types of experiences that, that we didn't necessarily have. So at Sweetwater Union High School District, um, we've been fortunate to, to be part of a pilot where we're working on a computer science class called Computer Science Principles, which is a pilot class that's going to be hopefully a, a college board approved AP course, but it's not your traditional computer science, uh, AP computer science class. It's more aligned with the computational thinking and it's more accessible to, to a wider array of, of students. And, and in addition, um, as we move into the next generation science standards and um, our common core math standards. We just, there's all these different opportunities that we've had uh, to incorporate computer science and robotics into our math curriculum. Uh, we've partnered up with, with UCSD on computer science courses in our middle schools. Uh, we are working collaboratively with our arts folks. So, so um, I think a lot of the progress that we've made over the last few years is, is that um, there's so much, there's so many great ideas. And, and just, uh, there's like-minded uh, folks that really understand the, the power of being able to, um, to be forward thinking. And, and this is a great opportunity in education, I think. You know, we've, for so long, we've been chasing after um, test scores, a bad policy around accountability, and there wasn't really the space for teachers to be able to take a step and, and, and realize what we all know is true is that everything's connected. And the more we facilitate and foster that environment of collaboration, the, the better outcomes we're gonna have for our students. Absolutely. Suzette. Thank you for having us here today. For all of you that are teachers in the audience, you may not know this, but you have a school board. And so generally, anything that happens in your district probably comes from a board goal. And so in Carlsbad, like all of your districts, we had to have a board goal that all of our students will leave the K-12 system ready for college and career. It's very general, but then within that, there are sub-goals and, and metrics. And one of the specific areas is STEAM education. And we were very lucky in Carlsbad. We opened a brand new high school in 2013, Sage Creek High School. It's a beautiful place. We invite anybody that would like to come and visit. And we opened that with a STEAM emphasis. We don't have boundaries in the district. The board decided not to assign high school boundaries. So we have now Carlsbad High School and Sage Creek. And so each high school has its own unique draw. Carlsbad High School is focused more on the arts and the telecommunication and those kinds of pathways, which would be the A in, in STEAM as well. And Sage Creek is focused on engineering and biomedical sciences. And we're using the Project Lead the Way curriculum. We're also a member of one of the five link learning consortium districts in the county that Laura mentioned, 
with uh, city schools, and I know we have a lot of folks from Unified here today, Oceanside, Escondido, and Grossmont. And then I'm really pleased to say we have so, such momentum that we have a team here from Calvary Hills Middle School with us, my fans here in the middle. Yay. Yay. <laughs> And, and really, it is an organic process, although the board has set an overarching goal. We know that without teachers and an interest in the principals and the leadership there uh, to, to drive this, we're looking at expanding STEAM to our middle school level and actually starting with two or three classes, I believe, next year using Project Lead the Way, a medical detectives class. Mm -hmm. uh, and a couple other classes in the engineering pathway. So it happens small, and that's how it's uh, rolling out in Carlson. Manifesting. Yeah. I want to um, ask a follow-up question to you both that um, relates to something that you said, Roman, that uh, you said that we have a great opportunity in education right now, and I think you were um, referring to the rollout of the Common Core Standards and the Next Generation of Science Standards, um, and you are implying that it's helping to promote integration. And I, I wondered if you could share with the audience the ways that's true, and maybe if there are any t ways that you're seeing that, um, uh, that, 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 that there is some competition. Because I know that the uh, teachers and disciplines are really having to learn the new standards and think um, differently about how they're implementing their curriculum. Is there also, in that sense, some resistance to some may perceive that it takes extra time to integrate and collaborate with their colleagues or with partners from the community. So just wondering what your experience is in, in your districts. Well, um, you know, schools are very uh, interesting places and, and, and I, I, I am a huge advocate for our, our, our public school systems because they're, they're, very, they're democratic, you know, and people have different beliefs and ideals and they're, they're in this air space where they're allowed, everyone's voice matters. Every parent, every student. And like, like any other shift, and this is a tectonic shift, you are gonna have people that are, that are so used to uh, the way things have been for so long. You know, when I started teaching in uh, 1999, um, it was just as the, the standards were rolling out, so everything I've known since in my whole um, career in education has been under this format of accountability. And, and it was uncomfortable for me as well. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, you, it's so important as, in leadership that we cultivate an environment where, where it's, it's very clear that this is a safe place and we're gonna try things that are different. And we don't expect everything to work 100% of the time. And also, um, it's really important that your resources align with your rhetoric. You know, so if teachers need, uh, just today, one of my, um, one of my uh, lead teachers was telling me that you know, we've already t trained 25 uh, teachers within our district to teach computer science principles, and we are looking to get another cohort of 25 um, through our, our partnership with, uh, with UCSD, and we had 40 teachers interested. So you know, what we do, is we figure it out, it's, we, we make it, because those are good things. So, so it's important that, that people feel the safety of being able to, to foster new practices, but that you also bring the resources, and, and you do everything humanly possible to just to eliminate that bureaucracy that so many times in, entrenches those good ideas. Because uh, I mean, the great ideas are out there in the sites, um, the energy, the students, and, and that's, I think, an important aspect of, of leadership in, in, in today's schools. The, the practitioners in here know, you know much more about the next generation science standards than I do, but what I do know is it's causing us to have to look at our content differently, and what we've been used to doing is we teach content and we make sure the kids know it really well, then we go do an experiment and we test it. In fact, I was just talking about this outside in the lobby when I got here today with one of our science teachers from Calavera, and so it's a little bit frightening to maybe start with the experiment first, and this is going to be a messy problem. So we're going to have to get comfortable with it. As Roman said, if the accountability isn't there, teachers are so conscientious, and, and they have been under tremendous pressure in our last several years with accountability. Thankfully, our state is going to give us a little bit of a, of a reprieve before we benchmark our API again. But I think that it's going to turn out to be good, and we've got such great teachers and such 
good thinking going on and good opportunities every time somebody comes to the Think a Bit Lab. That's sorry, Ed Abeda, but that's about a year's worth of tuition in a teacher ed program coming to the Think a Bit Lab for a day to wow. seeing how you can let your students loose and that they'll be okay. They're not going to blow up anything. I heard from one of my teachers today, all they did was drop an exacto knife and it wasn't a bad <laughs> But you take you have to take chances and so I think that's how the new standards will will change and they'll be a little messy and science is messy. And I think it's important for us as partners to you to be aware of uh, hyper aware of the um, big transition that's happening and to um, work with you to capitalize on the opportunities that that change is creating. Ed Abeda. So uh, have to wonder, how, how did you come to STEAM? From where you sit at UCSD Extension, what caused your passion for STEAM and, and caused you to lead our community in, in embracing and integrating the STEAM ideas here in San Diego? You know, fair enough. I think uh, in 2010, uh, as I was trying to look at a framework of building a department of K through 16 outreach and programming, there was a lot of folks that was talking about STEM, 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 and as I started to go into the uh, inquiry process about building a framework where we could move forward with different programming, one thing was missing, and it was tied to this, t at that time, the No Child Left Behind Act of Testing and Real Rigid Standards, and in that process, the arts were missing, and music programs, other things. And so it was very clear, as you dig deeper, that UCSD has been built on a whole framework of research, but what little is known about UCSD is how much knowledge and leadership there is in the arts, even at UCSD. Mm -hmm. And so you find the, ba the balance between those two, that it's not just one or the other. It's not this whole left side of solving problems, but there's also this other creative discovery side. And isn't that the essence of research, the discovery process, the inquiry process? So if we're looking at that process of looking at imagination and creativity, just going out and solving problems and looking at algorithms may not be enough. The question is, is how does that help our human condition? How does that apply in a way that makes us better citizens, mm -hmm. stewards of a planet that we're here to lease from? How does it actually help us be better partners and collaborate and disagree with civility? So the difference is, it's not just about solving problems. It's about how those are applied in our everyday daily lives, mm -hmm. not just locally, but as a world that is a global village now. I can see the, um, I can, I, I feel that DNA in this event and, and I think you're having an impact uh, on many of us, including potentially, Ed, can you tell us a little bit about, well, many of you have probably visited the Think A Bit by now. How, how many of you had a chance to go over there? Okay, good, a good number. And how many of you have actually witnessed students experiencing the Think A Bit lab experience? So about, about a third actually. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that and how, um, how arts and creativity were, ended up as part of the Think of It experience. Was that there from the outset or was it something that arrived? It was there from the outset, but I will say that um, I probably wasn't a believer at first um, in the arts and we are very much a STEM environment here, hardcore engineering and hardcore math. Um, but it's amazing to see how that's evolved and how my own mind has evolved around the importance of arts in the experience that we're giving to young people. Uh, we are a dedicated makerspace for middle school students, grades six, seventh, and eighth. Since September, more than 1,800 students have visited the lab. Uh, we run labs uh, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of every week. It's a full day out of school experience. And during that time, more than 850 robotic projects have been created by students. Um, it has been nothing short of amazing to see what these young people create when we don't put any boundaries around them and their abilities. Uh, there's no front loading, so every student gets to the lab and they're all starting from the same starting line. They're all in that pole position and then they're just given all the equipment that they need to be successful in a flipped classroom and make it happen. And the vast majority of them make it happen in an hour and a half, never having coded, never having held an Arduino, never having known what they're about to do. And so they go to the craft store, uh, fortified by oriental trading. They pull down animals and figurines and popsicle sticks and glue and uh, they create the most amazing uh, innovations in that short period of time. Uh, please go to the Instagram site and you can check it out. But uh, what these sixth, seventh, and eighth graders can do um, amazes us on a daily basis. And it is because of the arts. 
Coding on its own, quite frankly, although a very creative uh, profession, it is a creative act to code and to develop, but the arts truly bring it to life. And they bring it to life right here at Qualcomm, of all places in the world. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and, and in particular, bring it to life for these young people who come in with zero. It's, it's just um, wonderful to, to witness. And I was talking to a teaching artist last night at the reception, and she talked about that same experience of walking into a room where kids have no basis for anything and how cr the creation process and the lack of boundaries, by the end, they've created something that they're proud of. Um, so Delu, let's, let's, so this is visual arts primarily that um, helps to enliven the think a bit experience. Um, and you are on the performing arts side. And so I'd, I was wondering if you could reflect for us on the performing arts as part of STEAM and, and also for you as a, uh, a person in the arts, how you've come to embrace and integrate STEAM as an idea that's important to your, to your work and to your organization. Sure. So um, at San Diego Youth Symphony and Conservatory, we work with hundreds of young musicians week after week after week in Balboa Park. That's been our historic program now for almost 70 years. And I was confronted immediately when I arrived at the Youth Symphony with the fact that those high achieving musicians are high achieving in many, many, many other areas. In fact, my very first year at the Youth Symphony, one of our students who was our concert master also won the National Siemens Science Competition solving an 18th century math problem. So, and other students have achieved other national awards at the same time that they are achieving outstanding musical performance abilities. Uh, so for me personally to see very quickly that, that STEAM as a, as a real life manifestation in these students uh, is just who they are. In a sense, this whole conversation is really just about meeting kids where they are. They are not artists. They are not scientists. They are learners. They are producers. They are um, engaged, curious, ultimately quite ambitious uh, people. And they're really just looking to the adults around them to make sure they have access to all of the resources and all of the opportunities and all of the training to continue to advance and progress in any of those areas where they have an interest. So, at San Diego Youth Symphony Conservatory, our first point of entry to this really is through the music. But as we started to look at where music was not available to students in the community, we also said, could see that there were other subjects not available to them. So we've collaborated uh, most, most robustly with Chula Vista Elementary School District, but we've now expanded our footprint into collaboration in City Heights. San Marcos, uh, we're now working with another community group in Solana Beach, and then we're advising um, school districts and, and community programs all over the country on how we've successfully helped a school district rebuild its own arts education capacity. But the entire time, we've been focusing on the arts being connected to all the other aspects of the student learning. It's not just about creating great performances, it's also about creating a great connection across all the learning spectrums. And so for us, as a performing arts organization, that's how we've approached this. I'd like you to say a little bit more, actually, about the act of performance mm -hmm. um, and what it takes, uh, what it requires for students to learn about themselves and the, the, the process of uh, creating a performance that you think relates to STEM, because we Sure. Yeah. So uh, actually, I'm going to share a simple anecdote. Um, in 2013, there was a, a Stanford professor, Tom Studall, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. And just about two years before that, uh, he was being interviewed in the Stanford Magazine. And he had been asked, who was your most important teacher? And he said, my bassoon teacher. Because he taught me to practice and listen, and practice and listen, hour after hour after hour. And in fact, what do you do when you are experimenting? Or what do you do when you are engaged in any kind of inquiry? It's about that tenacity. It's about that rigor. And ultimately, of course, in the case of music, it's in preparation for a performance. And we've probably all been to performances where maybe the musicians we've heard, not just children, by the way, but adults, maybe they didn't do quite enough uh, preparation before they stepped on stage. Um, 
And so from a musical perspective, it may not have been as rich. However, even if that's the case, the, the act of stepping on stage in and of itself gives confidence. And I think that that's probably part of what you're seeing at the Linkabit Lab is kids suddenly see themselves capable of something they didn't know they were capable of before. And so the act of performance, in a sense, reinforces the, the whole range of the possible, not just as a musician, mm. but in all things. And really, I'll say when we had our first cohort of, of elementary students, transition into middle school this past year, I was at a performance and I could see in the demeanor and in the confidence and in the social maturity that they exhibited that even if they had given up music at that point after four years, they had gained the skills they needed to actually achieve whatever they wanted in life. And their families were there to witness that. Uh, and one of the observations you made when we had an earlier conversation is that STEAM is one way of engaging families um, in children's education. And so if, if you have a couple more things to say about that, but then I wondered, Suzette and Roman, if you might reflect on that also, if exhibitions or other manifestations of STEAM education are ways that you, your school folks find to, uh, to connect with families and bring them into schools. Can we hear from them first? Sure, absolutely. I, I'm putting them on the spot. I, I, well, again, Carlsbad is, we are so fortunate. We, we're like in the, I call it the Silicon Valley of the North. We've got Legoland, we have Viasat, we are just, we have tailor-made golf. I mean, all these action sports industries so that technology plays a big piece in what those or, uh, companies do, but we have uh, the first Lego Robotics League and robotics teams at all of our our schools, our elementary schools, and um, we have Science Olympiad. We have a great foundation that helps us support that, and those bring out parents, um, you know, in, in tremendous ways. So I think those are two, just two examples of where you get a lot of people involved, and in the, in the students are so engaged and excited and so too are their parents. They're a great draw. And parent, when parents see those things happening, uh, it just reaffirms for them how different school is. Because sometimes parents think school should be just like it was when they went to school, because that feels safe and good. And then at the same time, they also want their students to you know, walk away with something better and more than they had. So. Yeah, and then one of the great opportunities we've had uh, ushering this uh, new era uh, under the Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards is we really um, had the opportunity to do a conceptual shift around, you know, what content are we teaching versus what are students doing? And I think it's, um, if you think about the, if anyone's familiar with the old California Science Standards, every single standard in every grade starts with students know. Students know, students know. And it, it almost implies that it's just based on knowledge. You know, I mean, just, memorizing things, you know, memorizing processes. So we've had the opportunity to reframe our practices around what students are doing, those performances. And we, we have, like many other um, districts around the state and county, um, uh, initiative uh, where students are doing performance tasks. So on each of the content areas, we've been able to create very rigorous, real life performance tasks. And we've also had the opportunity to engage local businesses. So we've had what we call our performance task showcase, where we'll call in you know, engineering, um, business partners in and, and, and English and math and science and history, and show them the performance tasks that we're asking students. And it's just a great opportunity of awareness and also to solicit feedback. And based on those meetings, we've been able to, to modify and even uh, strengthen um, the tasks that we're asking students to do. And, um, so, so, you know, in terms of, of, of arts, you know, I, I just reflect how much I lament that, um, you know, the only thing I know how to play is uh, the radio. You know, I, <laughs> I, I couldn't dance uh, to save my life. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I also think, you know, I knew math. And what, my parents were, were both born in Mexico, and, and I had limited um, experiences and opportunities, but I, I knew math, and, and that just, in my mind, that was a way that I was, to your point, um, able to 
express my creativity and my problem solving and my logic. And I agree that um, we have to meet our students where they are and give them those opportunities and create that, that um, foster that climate where, where they could thrive. Yeah. Yeah, I love that idea that our students are STEAM. They fundamentally are STEAM. Can I have two points about the parents? Because Please I think one do. Of the, yeah. One of the um, fundamental challenges that schools that serve low income families, and particularly families that um, have English language learners in the family or the parents, um, maybe have education levels that are well below the education levels that we're aspiring to for our students, those families are very intimidated by the schools and the school site, and they do not know how to comfortably enter into the, into the school space. And the arts, um, in particular, give them an, an entry point. Um, and to give you some idea of how extreme this is, uh, one of the schools where we're working, they have about 150 seat uh, multipurpose room. They thought that by booking a, a holiday concert with all of the grades, they would not overfill that room of 150. That's how seldom parents were coming to this campus. They had a thousand parents show up this night. It was not a fun experience for the principal. <laughs> um, but it really be became a testament to how much the arts on that campus was changing the culture, was helping the parents feel like they belonged there. And then you can draw lines to the other learning experiences that the students are having. One of the other techniques that we've employed is actually having the students teach their parents. And when I was explaining this to one of the principals, she said, oh my gosh, I should do that with math. I should get my kids teaching the parents what they learned in math. So I think that, that through these experiences with the arts, you can actually then find other applications that will further deepen the, both the connection with the parents, but ultimately, most importantly, the parents' sense of connection with the school and with the child's learning. I'm kind of a softie, but that, that story about a thousand people showing up brought tears to my eyes. Um, thank you for sharing it. Um, okay, I want to shift us a little bit to this idea of career and college ready, which Suzette, you already said, is the mission of, of your um, school district, and I'm sure it sort of uh, resembles the missions that all of us feel in our work every day. Um, and I really wanted to share a quote that Suzette introduced me to from someone named Ray McNulty, who was the Secretary of Education in Vermont. Um, a bit ago, and I worked with him briefly at the Gates Foundation. Um, and what he said is that the primary aim of education is not to enable students to do well in school, but to help them do well in the lives they lead outside of school. And um, it, I've, ha I've really appreciated reflecting on that quote and, and reminding uh, myself and, and um, in our work that it's not about the grades, it's not about the test scores, it's enabling children to, to do well outside of school while they're in school, but also into their future. And I think that's what, when we say career and college ready, that's really what we are about and what we're aiming for. And so I want to explore this idea of how STEAM relates to, to that, to supporting our children to be ready to do well outside of school for the lives they lead outside of school. So um, Ed Hidalgo, um, you've been working with Suzette and with many partners on a plan for our county to really escalate the way we support career pathways in high schools, um, which are in many high schools in various um, states. And many uh, career pathways present a really terrific opportunity to bring STEAM to life because they often um, create space to integrate across subjects and they can involve career themes like um, digital and media arts or engineering and design. Um, or I've even visited health pathways in our community where arts are a key part of how they um, help students understand uh, health and science concepts. So what, what are your, um, where, what have you seen about STEAM and career pathways and, and what other thoughts would you share about why you've been motivated to support the growth of career pathways in San Diego? I think uh, exposure is a, is a huge part, right? One of the prompts that we uh, often speak to is, how does a child aspire to a career they don't know exists? So, you know, I think a lot of your panelists here today have already shared the value of the arts and creativity and gaining self-confidence, um, putting themselves in difficult situations, working their ways out of it in a creative way. And that's how our engineers operate here at Qualcomm, naturally. It is a design process. 
um, engineering, but so are uh, the processes of HR. Uh, Erwin Jacobs would often say, innovation isn't just for engineers. Uh, he was speaking to the 30% of us who aren't engineers here um, that need to come up with creative ways of solving difficult problems. And I think the arts, um, in many ways, allow us to better understand ourselves, understand how we creatively solve problems. Um, it allows us to use our hands, it allows us to use our ears, all of our senses, um, to come up with creative solutions. So we're not just benchmarking someone else's solution to a problem, but we're coming up with real innovation. And, and that's one of the things that I see in the benefits of the arts and the combination of the arts. And then with the career pathways, students can naturally see a real possibility for themselves down the road. Again, how does a child aspire to a career they don't know exists? When a school is providing career pathways and opportunities for them, they can naturally see the, the connection between what they're doing today to what's possible for them tomorrow. Suzette, what would you? Uh, I was at Viasat last night. For those of you that don't know, Viasat is a, a large company in uh, Carlsbad. They're all over the United States, but I think their headquarters is in Carlsbad. And they have a lot of government content. Uh, contracts, they have developed satellites that we use in our military now, and they, they do a lot with telecommunications and everything that we're using every day, um, they have probably their, their fingerprints or handprints on, just like Qualcomm has in the, tele, uh, the coding industry. But I was there last night, there were females. This is another big issue, and I know that Qualcomm Qualcomm recognizes this, girls going into engineering and math and science and you know being the only one in the computer science class. So it was a panel of six engineers speaking to our middle school and high school girls that had been in the Science Olympiad competition. And one of the, uh, the question was, how did you prepare you know, for the engineering? And the engineer said, it was very important for me to be a good communicator. And I also played music and I was in theater and my dad told me if you're going to be an engineer you're going to be working with a lot of men that probably may not listen to your ideas as readily and if you can communicate better and you're confident um, that will help you in that engineering world. And I hadn't thought of that connection until she shared that with, with our young ladies and I thought that was important and worth sharing. Yeah. Okay, so um, suppose K-12 embraces STEAM, our schools across San Diego County are STEAMified, uh, and we're graduating these uh, career and college ready kids, and they're coming off to UCSD or to any of the other universities in our region. How, I, we heard a little bit from some higher ed folks earlier today, but what's your prediction about whether higher education is also starting to move in the direction and embrace this integration across uh, across subjects and between, um, especially between STEM and the arts. Right. Well, they don't have a choice <laughs> uh, because uh, they can have all the policies, but industry dictates that we have to change because ultimately our schools have to prepare an end product. And at UCSD, we're noticing right now that disciplines are merging. You don't have a single discipline. You have wearable electronics. You have impact of disciplines that cross over in so many ways, or visual arts, the hard sciences. And when you start looking at the whole concept about work readiness, this last year, Lumina Foundation did a study in which they pulled hundreds of higher ed administrators and said, how are we doing in higher ed to prepare for the workforce? And of course, we gave ourselves an A+. Plus. We're doing great. <laughs> Same study they did, though, and start talking to industry. How are we doing? About 11% said we're doing the right job. Why? They may be able to have all the right subjects in STEM, but are they equipped to actually change the world? In music, what I find so amazing with what Deleuze is doing with U Symphony, it's amazing not just to learn the instru instrument, but to collaborate, to find that you have to be dependent on someone else to make <coughs> harmony and music and beauty. And the same skill set is what we have to go and apply in industry. When we're coming out and we come to big industry and we're finding to solve a problem, you don't have a problem in which you just put someone uh, a task anymore to solve it. You have to come together in teams, work on projects, collaborate, disagree with civility. And where do you learn those ideas for creative solving, that divergent thinking, that options of thinking, many, many options to solving a problem? And I'm very blessed growing up, I have to say, because my father was a first generation student, came to college, and he was an English and math major, but at nighttime when we were studying growing up, my sister, who was actually an engineer, we had the beauty of him playing guitar. 
And he always used to tell me, you know, music is the same as mathematics. It's just code. But more importantly, it allowed him to express himself differently. And I find that also, as we look to the future, we have sometimes an history about how to express ourselves, how to let out the stress. The arts also has another element to it of uh, the human condition, of being able to pacify the lines, you know, being able to have expression in which is not in a way that could be disruptive. So if we look in the future for preparing, we have to really think about what are we preparing to solve STEM and be great scientists? Are we actually preparing them to solve problems? And not just, for example, to have science for science sake, but how do we teach those leaders in Washington to be better decision makers? How do they work with the rest of the world? How do they be contributors and know how to reach across the aisle to solve problems? Those are the concerns that are tried directly to our overall collaboration preparing our workforce and ultimately connects right back into where we're teaching in K through 12. So it's a pipeline, it's all through the life stages and the arts are part of that equation that enable us to think creatively and ultimately see the beauty and harmony between the differences that make up our world. Okay, so Roman, let's see, let's go back to the K-12 part of the pipeline <laughs> and let's talk about school leadership. So if we talked, if you went quietly, because we shouldn't do it publicly, we wouldn't want to make anyone uncomfortable, but if you went and talked to the principals in Sweetwater and you came to them and said, I want to talk to you about STEAM, would they all know what you were talking about? Would they, maybe they would know what the letters meant, but do you think they would all have a sense for what it would be to, to do STEAM in their school? Or what, how, how predominant is it, I'm trying to get at, in, uh, in, uh, in school leadership? You, you know, um, I think we're fortunate that, um, in my opinion, it's been snowballing. You know, and it's something that the sites are very much anxious. Not, I mean, they, they have a certain level of, of awareness and readiness, but they're, they're hungry and thirsty for more. Uh, last week, just last week, I, I brought in uh, two of the professors from UCS, three of the professors from UCSD that are working with us to talk to all the principals about um, our, where we are in terms of our computer science principles. Um, we also had a STEM symposium um, in January where we brought in, all, we have various engineering pathways through Project Lead the Way. Uh, all, all of our schools uh, have robotic stipends, so there's robotics clubs in every school. We have um, numerous uh, computer science clubs that participated in the Cyber Patriot competition. So it's something that, that I think if you would have asked two years ago, it would have been very, very minimal, but it just in the last year, I feel that that awareness has just been, been rising and rising, and I think it's a testament. Um, it's, to uh, our um, teachers and administrators and counselors' willingness to engage with, with numerous thought partners and leaders in the field. Like, uh, I, I know we send um, probably out of our um, uh, 11 comprehensive middle schools, I know we send all of them to the, to the to lab here in Qualcomm. So those types of opportunities are, are just enormous. Um, we have, uh, science fair at every school and we, we participate in the science festival. Uh, you know, Ed's been a very valuable thought partner in, um, in helping us just raise the awareness. And, and I would say that it's more than awareness right now, it's a hunger and excitement to build more uh, STEAM programs in our, pro in our schools. I just want to say, uh, I think one of the tenets, not only of what we're talking about, but really what we've heard throughout the day today and Ed started it this morning by saying, you know, this is, this is an effort. The STEAM effort is a combination of government, policymakers, educators, community and community organizations, and industry. And in a sense, we all need to function the way that we are wanting to see our students learn across disciplines, across uh, the boundaries of our traditional silos that we, we in fact actually have to model in a way. And that the, the, the expectation that the schools, one, have the resource and or have enough of a knowledge base to make the evolution that we as a society are asking of them. And it's, you know, the, the influence of the new um, standards, the new, um, accountability tests, like they've got and the new um, local control funding formulas here in California, those alone are huge things for them to confront. And at the same time, the rest of the community is saying, 
and we want you to do this, and we want you to be prepared in this way, and we want you to, and we want you to. We can't say we want you to. We have to say we're here to help you, and we believe we have this to support you. And so that's the approach we've taken at San Diego Youth Symphony. We are not running programs in the music, or sorry, music programs in the school day. We are piloting some work. We are helping the school district rebuild its own capacity. And I think that the kinds of projects that we're hearing about here from Qualcomm, and I know, Ed, you said last night, we need more industry in San Diego to step up in the same way. That, that is as much as any other actual instructional content or concept you may take away from this day is the notion that this is a community effort and it is dependent on all four of those pillars to be successful for the benefit of all of our children and all of us. Yeah, I actually wore my partnership pin today to <laughs> exemplify those ideas. Um, Suzette, what, uh, so making those partnerships come alive, what are some facilitators, what are some impediments, um, and you know, towards the goal of STEAM, what do you see as, because uh, we need, this, this was a room of adherence, and so we are also advocates, we talked about that earlier today, and so to this room of potential advocates for STEAM and potential partners for your schools, what would you um, tell us about both the opportunities and the things we need to work to overcome? I don't know if anybody saw the Time Magazine article last month of what the new economy is, is the sharing economy. And companies like uh, Airbnb, you know, 425,000 people a night. Airbnb, you can just rent, it's like VRBO, but it's by the night. Uber, Lyft, Uber is now a 41.2 million, a billion dollar company. What you've been hearing up here is, I think we need to focus on that sharing economy idea. As Americans, we're kind of getting to realize we don't need as much stuff, and that we can share with each other. And it's built around you know, the sharing of human and physical resources instead of in our silos. Uh, colleges are here, nonprofits are here, K-12 is here, business is here. I, I think we can play in the same sandbox. I know we can and we can, we can do it well, and the resources are out there. And so I think if we have that, you know, the new possibilities are we're a sharing economy, I think, in education. Well, that's relevant to the question that I just got, um, which is directed at you, Ed. Um, the audience member is asking, how do we um, articulate the return on investment for our industry leaders to partner with us so that they come to the sandbox to, to play with us. What's, what would you advise us on that ROI question? You have, you have to know your industry leader to find out what's important to them, mm -hmm. I think, first. Um, here, fortunately, it was bred into the culture through our founder, Dr. Wynne Jacobs, as you all know, uh, a strong philanthropist in our community. Giving back is part of our DNA. Um, but for others, um, it might be a creation of a pipeline of talent for them because they know they can't find the talent today uh, your question really is only, where are you going to start? Are you going to start at middle or high school or the collegiate level? Um, we'll have 800 interns here this summer. Um, so ours isn't uh, um, one, uh, one approach. It's a multi-pronged approach at developing talent. But really, when you look at the Think a Bit Lab, it's really about serving the community and being a good partner. And shouldn't all companies want to aspire to being a good community partner? And where better to, to uh, partner than in the preparation of our community and our youth? Uh, the ones who are going to take care of us one day, <laughs> right? Ed, what would you add about that, making the ROI case? I think, uh, as uh, Ed eloquently said, it's not a question is uh, if industry and knowing uh, that they're going to have to engage, it's that they have no choice to engage anymore. <laughs> the fact is, is that teachers and schools and superintendents can't do it alone. Industry has to be part of the equation, and they can't be the end point, and that's the problem. At some point, Going through the pipeline, we talk about leaks through the pipeline. Well, at the end of the pipeline, we still need industry at the table. And many times we get in these uh, discussions around education, but we forget to put industry at the table. So it's even a paradigm shift as we're talking about sharing. Sharing not just in resources, but knowledge. Uh, it has to be an integrated problem-solving approach that nonprofits, uh, educators, uh, policymakers have to come together. But don't be at a table just speaking to uh, each other about uh, without a different perspective. That is a key part of the dissonance that needs to go on and disruption at the table to find the best ideas. 
And if I might, we have found in this, we have applied for two grants in our county as a region, a $15 million grant and a $6 million grant, a Career Pathways Trust Grant. Ed was very helpful as a business partner in that, and we're waiting to see if we get those grants in May. What we, and we have to engage, it's a workforce development grant, so you have to engage your business community in that process from the beginning. And what we found as we were developing that grant, industry wants to be involved. Mm -hmm. They want to help us. They don't know how. And, and they're getting less fixated on the ROI. And they recognize that a metric on a test score isn't the only way that we can show that students yeah. are learning and benefiting okay. from their partnerships. We have to be able to tell them what we need. And I don't think we in, edu in K-12 education have been able to articulate that as well. And we're, we've got to get better. And not money. We, do, we shouldn't just ask for money. Resources. Yeah. We need your engineers to come over and work with our teachers for six weeks and help us as we're teaching this unit on X or Y. So I think I have found in this last, and Ed Hildago, would you agree, that yes. as we've been in this grant writing process, yes. industry is ready. And so. we have so many resources here in San Diego County, so many huge industry partners to tap, whether they're in the arts, education, in technology, energy. So I, I think we, um, we're detecting a strong sense of imperative and, you know, even, uh, and willingness, and that's great. I want to bring it back to students for our last note, um, Ed, because a key part of the Think A Bit experience is the career awareness um, training that you give to kids or the, ex the career awareness experience that you give to them in the beginning. And, um, you had a recent experience with the VISTA principals where their um, experience of doing that with you helped them think about personalizing learnings. If you could describe a little bit more about that so that we um, get the kids back in our heads sure. um, as we close out this panel. Absolutely. Well, the Think A Bit Lab actually came out of a career counseling practice that we started here at Qualcomm back in 2009, which seems like an unlikely place to start a STEM lab or a makerspace. Uh, but the premise was really about helping our own employees get into their own zone by understanding their strengths, interests, and values, being more capable to manage their own careers, and get themselves into the sweet spot here at Qualcomm. Um, the premise being, too, that if you can get an employee in their zone, there's a better likelihood that they're going to be highly engaged in their work, which means they're going to be more productive. So as we've now had over 8,000 employees go through this practice, throughout the years, we started adapting uh, our, our teachings uh, to our, our youth that were coming in. And uh, it's been a quite, quite an interesting experience, actually, um, when we're using instruments like the Strong Interest Inventory, in some cases, the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, and the StrengthsFinder 2.0, uh, to help these students understand their own strengths, interests, and values. So as we've shared this with educators, it's very interesting. Um, they start coming up with these statements of, wow, we should really start with a student helping them get into the zone, right? So why give a child um, access to career pathways if they don't understand their own strengths, interests, and values and how they align to the world of work? I failed algebra three times in high school, but that's where I spent most of my summers doing remedial math. Um, I'm social, enterprising, art, and artistic in my strengths. I'm not conventional, realistic, or investigative, which most closely align to uh, <laughs> mathematic computation, computer sciences, engineering. Um, I'm in my dream job today. I'm in my zone. I'm deploying my strengths, interests, and values every day here at Qualcomm. How can we help our young people? Because believe me, at sixth grade, they're very much understanding the importance of values and their own personal values. And then for them to understand that they can align them to a, a job, to align that to a job that one day they would love, they never thought that was possible. And there's ways that we're adapting those instruments to be able to use in that way. And it's so exciting to partner with Superintendent Lovely and other superintendents who are asking, how are you doing this? How can we do this? How can we partner on this? And um, I think it could be a game changer. For us, N equals one. Start with the individual. And I, I, love, I love that that's emerged from this panel, that STEAM is a way of finding students in their place, finding what's, what their strengths and helping them discover, sorry, helping them discover what their strengths are, what, what inspires them, what motivates them, um, and STEAM is a powerful way to get there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.